Kwame, an 18-year-old young man, sat anxiously in the sterile, fluorescent-lit waiting room of the hospital. His heart pounded, his stomach twisted into tight knots as he waited for the birth of his first child, Kamal. But beneath the anticipation, a darker, more painful reality weighed heavily on him. Kamal's mother was also his own mother, Amina. The complexity of their relationship was a grotesque and unfathomable secret. In any culture, especially one grounded in the norms of Western morality, the idea of a mother and son engaging in such a relationship is horrifying, and to conceive a child from that relationship? Unthinkable. Nine months earlier, Kwame woke one morning, his mind already weary with a burden too heavy for any 18-year-old to bear. His soul yearned for redemption, for some kind of divine mercy. That morning, Amina entered his room with a soft smile. She wrapped him in a warm embrace, her fingers gently stroking his hair before she delivered the news that would forever alter his life. The test came back positive, she whispered. You're going to be a father. Kwame's breath caught in his throat. Really? he asked, his voice cracking with disbelief. Amina nodded, and as he placed a trembling hand on her growing belly, tears spilled down his cheeks, this time not from despair but from overwhelming emotion. Yes, she replied, and this will be a journey like no other. When I carried you, things were so different. I had your father, he was a pediatrician and knew all there was to know about children. But you, you're still so young. You're barely out of your own childhood. You don't know what this life holds for you. I know, Mama, he said, his voice steadying as he stared at the life growing inside her. But I'll figure it out. I'll be responsible. That's my child in there, the one who will bring me the happiness I've always dreamed of. Kwame was a good kid and Amina knew it. She had always been proud of him. He was hardworking, intelligent, and driven. Despite his youth, he balanced studying engineering and working part-time jobs to help support their small household. When Amina was too exhausted to cook, Kwame would take over, preparing lunch or even surprising her with dinner. Sometimes he'd greet her in the morning with breakfast on a tray, candles lit, as if he were some kind of Prince Charming. They had become inseparable over the years, especially after realizing it was just the two of them against the world. They promised each other they would never let go. Kwame admired his mother's strength and wanted to embody the same courage she carried. He worked even harder, lending a hand to neighbors in Kijiji Jindogo, their small town, all while preparing for the arrival of the child growing inside Amina. The added responsibility meant his studies and work grew more demanding, but no matter how difficult, he couldn't break the promise he had made to his mother to never abandon his education or his desire to be a good man. As the months passed, they became more excited with each milestone of the pregnancy. Together they went out shopping for baby supplies diapers, pacifiers, baby bottles. They chose unisex colors, waiting for the surprise of learning the baby's gender. When Amina reached seven months along, the suspense added to their excitement, making each day more magical. Kwame took to decorating the baby's room, painting it a soft, powdery blue neutral enough for either a little boy or girl. He hung delicate paintings of birds and animals on the walls, images of life and nature that filled the space with warmth. In one corner, he placed a record player, imagining soothing lullabies that could calm his child's cries late at night. It was true Kwame was elated. The thought of having a child stirred something deep within him. He had always loved children, their innocence, their purity. Whenever he saw them in the street, he couldn't help but smile from ear to ear, believing that they had the power to change the world simply by existing. But there was no denying the reality they lived in. Their town was small, tight-knit, and in a place like that, news spread fast too fast. The whispers had already begun, though no one dared confront them directly. For now, they could only wait for the inevitable storm to come crashing down. It was a scandal that rippled through Kijiji Dogo like wildfire. People were stunned when they learned the shocking truth that an 18-year-old boy had gotten his own mother pregnant. The disgust was palpable, and not a single soul in town thought otherwise. When the pair returned from their shopping trips, whispers would follow them, thick with judgment. Amina, burdened by deep shame, kept her head low, while Kwame walked beside her, simmering with frustration. One quiet afternoon, 
they strolled through a deserted street. The air was still, and the early hour meant that hardly anyone was around. Kwame had taken Amina to the doctor for some tests, and on their way back, they decided to greet the local carpenter, Kofi, a man Kwame had always treated kindly. But this time, the warm welcome they expected was replaced by harsh words. Get out of here! Kofi shouted, his voice thick with anger. His heart seemed to shatter as he uttered the words. She's been taking advantage of him all along. I swear it Kofi ranted to his apprentice. I've seen them always holding hands and once I even caught her hugging him but not like a mother should. Something was off his voice cracked as he continued. This is a disgrace. Kijijin Dogo can't bear the weight of such a monstrous scandal. We need to do something. We'll take it to the church and let Pastor Dlamini decide. At the church, they relayed the situation to Pastor Dlamini, who was left speechless. Though he'd already heard the whispers, he had yet to meet Amina and Kwame face to face. Pastor, we can't live with this abomination among us. This town is sacred, and we won't tolerate their sins any longer. They must be banished send them straight to hell, where they belong. Kofi's anger was infectious and his words were filled with venom. Don't worry, son Pastor Dlamini said, placing a hand on Kofi's shoulder. I'll talk to Kwame. We'll make sure to guide him back to the righteous path, far away from that woman the true evil in this world. Pastor Dlamini then penned a letter to Kwame, inviting him for a conversation. I hope this letter finds you well. There are matters we must discuss, things the town has been saying, and I believe it's important for us to speak here in the house of the Lord. Please come before sunset. It's a matter of great urgency, and I would appreciate your presence. Kwame knew exactly what the meeting would be about, and despite the weight on his shoulders, he made his way to the church, lacking any real enthusiasm. Once inside, he sat in one of the pews, gazing up at the large crucifix hanging before him. His thoughts were heavy as he prayed for his mother and the unborn child she carried. I see you're deep in prayer, Kwame came Pastor Dlamini's voice, breaking the silence. Kwame crossed himself, ending his prayer respectfully before replying. It's always good to pray for those we love, Pastor. I'm here because of your letter. You mentioned something important. Yes, indeed, my son. Follow me. Pastor Dlamini led Kwame down a narrow hallway, guiding him into his office, a place where he handled the town's most delicate matters. Once inside, Pastor Dlamini gestured for Kwame to sit. Though reluctant, Kwame complied out of politeness. He watched as Pastor Dlamini pulled the heavy curtains closed, darkening the room. Do you know why I asked you to come? Pastor Dlamini asked, turning to face Kwame. Though Kwame could guess, he shook his head, wanting to hear it directly from the pastor. Pastor Dlamini's lips curved into a small, tight smile a smile that held something darker beneath it. It's because word has spread. The town knows that your mother is expecting a child. Congratulations are in order after all. A baby is a blessing full of innocence and love. Wouldn't you agree? Of course, Pastor. We're looking forward to finding out the baby's gender soon so we can finish setting up the nursery and pick out what we still need. Pastor Dlamini's tone shifted as he turned his back to Kwame, staring out the window. And who, may I ask, is the father of this child? Kwame felt a chill crawl up his spine. He swallowed hard before responding with a nervous smile, that would be me, Pastor. The room fell silent. Pastor Dlamini stiffened, his back still turned. So the rumors are true, he said, his voice barely a whisper, the weight of those words hanging in the air like a storm about to break. Let me tell you, everyone is furious. And they won't let you continue doing this to your mother. What are you talking about, Pastor? Kwame asked. You know exactly what I mean. Don't play dumb. Being with your mother and now bringing a child into this world from such a vile relationship, it's beyond unforgivable. You need to cleanse yourself, repent, and ask God for forgiveness, or you'll regret it. We've done nothing wrong, Pastor. You shouldn't be angry with me for this. I know God is watching over me, and he understands my situation. Otherwise, he wouldn't have blessed me with this child. You need to leave, son. But before you go, I'm giving you one last chance. Tell your mother to cut ties with you, and not to bring that child into this world. It's an abomination in the eyes of everyone. 
you'll be despised forever. Never, pastor. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks. I will be happy with my new family, and no one, not even you, can take that happiness from me. Kwamim stormed out that day, feeling like the world had shattered around him. Only he knew how hard this was, yet it was his deepest dream. A few days later, letters started arriving at Amina's house, filled with hateful messages calling her a bad mother, a disgrace, a and worse. The letters warned her not to have the baby, threatening terrible things would happen, saying another evil was on its way. But Amina knew that this child would be loved, especially by its father. Kwame was already brimming with excitement. Amina never told her son about the letters because she knew he was already struggling enough with his work. Kwame labored for the local builder every day, helping him out as much as he could, until one morning the builder pulled him aside. I'm sorry, son the builder said. I've got some bad news and I don't want you to take it personally. I can't have you working for me anymore. It's not because of anything you did, but I can't afford to be kicked off the town council or lose my place in the church. You know how devout I am. But sir, you know I can't lose this job right now. Please have mercy on me. Don't leave me without a way to support my family. I won't be able to manage. I'll do something for you. I'll give you some money, enough to get by for a while. But after this all blows over, you'll need to pay me back by working again, okay? Kwame the man cared for him, even though he was hurt by the news. He took the money, went home, and told Amina. She cried hard, having expected this all along. Then she confessed about the letters, which made Kwame furious. Why didn't you tell me? We're not going to fight, son. It's the whole town against us. We need to put our hearts into our prayers and focus on bringing this baby into the world healthy and strong. You'll hold him with such joy one day. We have to be strong and we'll make him strong too. Remember, it's just you and me. Kwame listened to his mother, calming down for the moment. Day by day, he coped with the situation, though it wasn't easy with no one else on his side. Months passed. And Amina received incredible news at the health clinic. The doctor smiled and revealed the gender of their soon-to-be-born child. It's a boy. Congratulations. Thank you Kwame and Amina beamed. I feel so happy. We'll give him a beautiful name Amina added. Yes mama, my son's name will be Kamal. Excuse me? Your son? The doctor asked, clearly shocked. Kwame smiled awkwardly, expecting the doctor to say something like that. But you're so young. How could you possibly with your own mother? The pair left the clinic without paying attention to the comments. Not only did they have to endure the town's judgmental stares, but they also faced rejection from the church, their friends, neighbors, and even their own family. Now, even the doctor who had once gladly cared for Amina throughout her pregnancy had turned against them. Kwame felt a deep sadness as he walked, his head hanging low until his mother gently placed her hands on his shoulders, kissed his forehead, and softly said, Don't worry, my love. This is our truth. Others have no right to judge what they don't understand. I just don't want anyone to hurt you, Mama Kwame replied, his voice thick with concern. My dear, they won't. I'll be all right as long as you are. Kamo needs a father who is strong and presents someone who will help build a family one step at a time. People around them were eavesdropping, their eyes filled with disdain. The audacity, they thought, of this family talking about love, family, and hope, especially in a place so sacred. The townspeople were convinced that they were doomed to eternal punishment, that their child would be the spawn of the devil himself. The final days of Amina's pregnancy were intense. Kwame spent most of his time at college, where he too faced relentless judgment from students and professors alike. He stared in disbelief at the poor grades he received on exams he knew were flawless. The cruelty of it all weighed heavily on him. Hey, you're going to have the devil's child. One of his classmates shouted mockingly. Don't say that. Get lost. Kwame fired back, struggling to keep his temper in check. He grabbed his books and started to walk out of the classroom when he overheard the same student hurling insults about his mother. That was the last straw. Kwame turned around and delivered a punch to the guy's face, hard enough to send a message. But the other boy retaliated with more force, and within moments, the classroom erupted into the biggest brawl the university had seen that year. When the chaos finally ended, the campus security had arrived. 
they handcuffed Kwame, while the other boy was let go without so much as a warning. Kwame couldn't understand why he was the one being hauled away, why the world treated him with such cruelty. He was exhausted from being an outcast and couldn't bear the thought of spending another moment behind bars. But soon enough, that's exactly where he found himself. The police officers were merciless, spitting vile words and beating him simply for being different. All Kwame wanted was a moment of peace. So, he closed his eyes and imagined Kamau in his arms, the baby he hadn't even met yet. That thought brought him the calm he so desperately needed, helping him endure the hours he spent locked away, waiting for his mother to arrive. Night had fallen, the night Kwame had long awaited, though not at all in the way he had imagined. Everything was spiraling out of control, and he had no idea how to fix it. Suddenly, Amina woke with a sharp pain in her belly, a fierce contraction that forced a scream from her lips. She knew it was time. She had to wake her son. Kwame, get up. She yelled, her voice strained. But he didn't hear her. Kwame, wake up now. I'm about to have Kamo. Panicking, Kwame rushed to help his mother. He didn't know how to support her in this moment, so he grabbed her arm and, with trembling hands, picked up the yellow bag that rested on her nightstand, a small light illuminating the photos of their loved ones. They began the slow walk outside into the cold night air. It was late and Amina, dressed in a long nightgown with house slippers, had her hair tied up in a messy ponytail. Sweat dripped from her face as she gasped for air, each breath becoming more painful than the last. Kwame ran to his car, only to find the tires slashed. Someone had played a cruel joke, knowing his mother was about to give birth. His heart pounded in his chest as he felt helpless, trapped. He began to shout for help, his voice echoing in the empty streets. When no one responded, he knocked on every door in the neighborhood. Please help me. My mom is about to give birth, and we need to get to the hospital. But one neighbor slammed the door in his face without a word. Desperate, Kwame knocked on another door, this time it was the house of a nurse who lived nearby. Please, you have to help us. I don't know what to do, he pleaded, his eyes glistening with tears. The nurse, Nandi, took one look at his tear-streaked face and knew she couldn't turn him away. Kwame had always been a kind boy, and she had seen enough of the town's cruelty toward him and his family. All right, I'll help, she said, stepping outside. But while we do breathing exercises, you need to find a car. We don't know how long we have, and this could be dangerous. As they hurried back to Amina, Nandi couldn't shake the dread that settled in her gut. She knew that by helping them, she might face the same hateful scorn from the neighbors tomorrow that the family endured every day. But in that moment, she decided that compassion was worth the risk. Meanwhile, Amina could hear her neighbors hurling cruel words at her, their voices sharp with judgment. No one came to her aid. Suffer, you sinful woman. No one will help you. You don't deserve God's forgiveness. You wanted a child just to use him, you terrible mother. At that moment, Nandi approached her gently and said, I'm here to help you. Let's get you inside where you can sit and relax so the pain isn't as bad. We don't know when the little one will arrive, okay? Nandi guided her indoors as Kwame hurried off to find the mason, but no one answered. Desperation overwhelmed him, sweat trickling down his chest in thick drops. He turned to prayer, the only thing that ever brought him peace, calming himself as he made his way back home, carrying his heart heavy with fear. Mother, no one is willing to help us. Only this kind woman, may God bless her forever, has shown us kindness. Everyone else recoils in disgust. Amina's heart sank further, but there was nothing left for her to say. Clutching her belly in agony, she whispered through gritted teeth, Kwame, we'll walk to the hospital. Don't worry about the others. Soon we'll have little Kamau in our arms. Let's just go. Nandi gave them a kind farewell, reminding them she'd be there soon as her shift was about to start. Kwame supported his mother, and they slowly made their way to the hospital, which thankfully wasn't far. Fifteen minutes later, they arrived with Amina on the brink of giving birth. The hospital was eerily empty. It was one of those places where few people ever came. Doctors sat in the corner, sipping coffee while nurses chatted quietly among themselves. But when they saw Amina, they hurried her onto a blue stretcher with thin white sheets and wheeled her into the delivery room. Everyone there knew what had happened. 
It was a small town and news traveled fast, flying like gossip from house to house. None of the nurses wanted to assist with the birth of the child, whom they saw as an abomination. The idea of a son fathering his own sibling sent shivers down their spines, and the entire town was in agreement. But there was one nurse who thought differently. She had heard whispers from another nurse, a neighbor who had helped the family. Determined to learn the truth, she investigated. When she uncovered the full story, sorrow washed over her, and she felt an immense sadness for the family. She approached Kwame, holding a green notebook, and pulled a pen from her chestnut-colored hair, clicking it to get his attention. As their eyes met, she gave him a soft, melancholic smile. He looked exhausted, a young man burdened by the weight of a town's scorn, someone who only longed to be accepted again. Once, he had been the pride of the community lifting wood for the carpenters, reading psalms in church, painting the neighbors' houses. He had been the town's golden boy, admired by all the women, whether as a potential suitor or a son. Now, those same women looked at him with disgust, their minds filled with darker thoughts. Excuse me, Mr. Kwame, I need to take down some information and get a blood sample. It's just for the baby's safety. Kwame nodded, following her down the hall where they had taken Amina. He didn't dare ask about his mother, though the silence felt unnerving. While the nurse tightened the strap around his arm and searched for a vein, she asked him basic questions. You'll be okay, sweetheart. Your mother and the baby will be fine. You just need to have patience, all right? I know what happened, Kwame. I looked into your case, and it breaks my heart that you and your mom have had to go through this. But please, stay strong. Life and God challenge us to see if we truly believe. I know, but no one understands, Kwame replied. The people in town threatened my mother. They want us gone, told us to pack our things. They've beaten me, and I've barely scraped by at college. I don't know if I have the strength to keep going. With all the compassion she could muster, the nurse placed her hand gently on his and asked him to pray. It was the only way, she said, that his heart would begin to heal, even if just a little. Kwame smiled weakly and thanked her, and in return she gave him a warm, reassuring smile. When he stepped outside he felt a slight calm wash over him. He took a seat back in the waiting room, his mind wandering over the words the nurse had just shared. He thought to himself, I'm already here, nothing else can go wrong. A sense of relief crept in, realizing that sometimes help comes from the most unexpected places. As his hands cradled his face, the exhaustion that had been building for hours took over, and he began to drift off to sleep. But just as his body surrendered to the weariness, people from the town started to filter in every last one of them. The neighbors who had slammed doors in his face, the bricklayer with his wife and children, the carpenter's crew, and even his own assistants, young boys who roamed the hospital grounds or the streets, filled the room. The space began to feel small, crammed with parents, siblings, and grandparents from the school committee, all waving freshly made signs bearing the couple's names, punctuated by bright red exclamation marks demanding that they leave. What caught Kwame off guard was the arrival of the town's priest, Pastor Dlamini, flanked by other clergymen, glaring at him with thinly veiled contempt, their whispers filled with disgust. The young man was bewildered by the crowd that had gathered, unsure why so many people were staring. The room formed into a rough circle, though space was tight, and they began murmuring amongst themselves. This is an abomination, one of the priests declared, his voice laced with fury. This boy deserves to be cast into the pits of hell, and his wickedness must be condemned. Kwame could hardly believe his ears, stunned as they insulted him openly. He's right, shouted another priest. We should rally the townspeople right here, ensure the nurses refuse to tend to that woman. She's depraved, just like her son. This is an outrage. Kwame stood abruptly, shaking his head in disbelief as he stormed toward the group of priests, anger boiling in his veins. What gives you the right to be here? He demanded. One of the priests, standing tall with a condemning stare, spoke. Kwame, you've always been a great help to the church, and we've known you to be a faithful servant of our Lord. But now we hear of this tragedy that your mother is about to give birth. This is nothing short of a catastrophe. No, pastor, you've got it wrong. Let me explain what really happened. 
There's more to this than you know. Kwame tried to reason, but the head priest, cane in hand, slammed it on the floor repeatedly, cutting him off. There's nothing to explain but the truth we all see clearly. He thundered. I learned your mother was giving birth in this very hospital, and came to warn the others. That creature soon to be born into this world will destroy our faith, faith that cannot be undone by anything or anyone. His voice softened mockingly. This is one of God's trials. Open your eyes and go home, boy the priest said, his tone final. Kwamim tried to speak again, but it was no use. No one was listening. As he stood there, a dreadful realization dawned. While he had been seeking help, his neighbors had been rallying others to mock and criticize the unthinkable event unfolding in the hospital. News had spread like wildfire, and it was the townspeople who had given the priest the idea to storm the hospital in protest. And now, there they all were, talking at once, some angry, others confused. The room buzzed with growing tension until suddenly, voices began to rise. We need to demand the doctors throw her out, someone shouted. Yes, let's handle this like adults, somewhere else. The child isn't to blame. He's being born into this world without any knowledge of his sins, one woman said, trying to find reason in the chaos. But another voice, sharp and bitter, cut in. That child is no innocent. He's the product of lust and vanity. Something must be done. We can't let that baby stay here in our God-fearing town. Lady, that's too much someone else replied, trying to calm the storm. Let's be reasonable. Suddenly, it became more than just a disagreement. The room divided into two clear factions, those who believed the couple should be left alone, and the others led by the priest, who were filled with venomous disdain. Some defended the baby, saying it was just an innocent life, while others insisted that the birth was an insult to their values. I think the couple just wants to rest. Let's leave them in peace, someone urged. But the opposing side, emboldened by the priest, grew louder, hurling more hateful words. We need to make it clear that this child will be the ruin of our town. The carpenter's assistant yelled from his corner, leaning against the hospital wall. No one will ever be happy watching that boy grow up. We'll always remember what they did. It's been nine months since they defiled themselves. The crowd erupted again, their voices rising like a storm, clashing like feral beasts completely out of control. There was no hope of silencing them, and they had no desire to calm down. This is the most sinful act to ever disgrace our town since its founding. Bellowed the reverend, his voice booming over the chaos. You do not deserve God's forgiveness, my child. You do not deserve anyone's forgiveness. The crowd's shouts intensified, and Kwame, standing amid the growing turmoil, tried desperately to bring peace. But the situation spiraled further out of hand. Police officers arrived, but even their presence couldn't quell the fury surging through the town. Men shoved each other. Women pointed and screamed about the injustice that had befallen their sacred community. Kwame, look at what you've done. The scene was a disaster, a chaotic reflection of the decision he'd made, which now weighed heavier than ever. Solve this, boy. One man yelled from the back. Kwame had no idea how to handle the boiling fury of his neighbors, but he knew one thing if he could just get their attention. He could hear the cry of his newborn son the one thing that truly mattered at that moment. Desperate, he climbed onto a stretcher, raising his arms to gesture for silence. Gradually, the noise began to subside, and finally, the crowd waited in an uneasy hush for him to speak. Please everyone listen. This hate has no place here. We are one town, one family, bound together in good times and bad. You all know me. I've spent my life studying, working hard, trying to be a good man, his voice wavered slightly, but he pressed on, locking eyes with an older woman in the front. Mama Kita, he called, pointing at her. When I was young, I worked for you. I worked for the mason, the carpenter, even helped the neighbors fix their plumbing. You all know me. But another woman shouted from the back, this has gone too far. We don't need to hear your life story. We need answers. My grandchildren can't grow up playing with that child about to be born. It's a cursed thing, not blessed by the Lord. Kwame's voice grew stronger. You're wrong. I'm still the man I've always been, and my son he'll grow up just like me. But another voice from the crowd snapped back, 
You've changed, boy. You're not the same. Kwame stood firm. No, I'm not. I'm the same man you've always known. Look at me. Look into my eyes. He smiled faintly, trying to diffuse the tension. I'm just like you. I enjoy simple things. I work hard. I study. I love tamales. I dance. I live life. But as he paused, his heart weighed down, and with a breaking voice, he whispered, I beg you, with everything I have, please just give me a chance. For a moment, the crowd hesitated. The fury that had gripped them for so long softened, but the reverend, his face twisted in anger, barked out, you're still a depraved soul. You'll never find forgiveness here. He stormed forward, waving his staff, flinging holy water at Kwame, chanting prayers to rid him of the demon he claimed possessed the young man. Once more, the crowd turned against Kwame, shouting in unison with the reverend. The chaos intensified as people yelled, pushed, and struggled to make themselves heard. Even those who silently supported Kwame felt powerless, swallowed by the frenzy. The police officers, helpless against the mob, stood back, offering Kwame apologetic glances from the distance. All the while, the reverend continued his holy assault, praying fervently for the young man's soul as the crowd followed suit. Suddenly, a sharp voice cut through the madness. Quiet, everyone. It was an elderly fruit vendor, her voice rough and commanding. Listen. She barked. The crowd fell silent again, and in that haunting quiet, a baby's cry pierced the air. Kamau had been born. Whispers began to ripple through the crowd. Though the town was once again in disarray, the murmurs were hushed, almost conspiratorial. Kwame turned, his heart swelling as he saw Amina being wheeled out of the delivery room by a nurse. In her arms she held their newborn son. The moment was bittersweet, the pure joy of seeing his child overshadowed by the weight of the town's judgment. Kwame down and kissed Kamo's forehead, and for a brief, fragile moment, they were a picture of happiness, of a family finally united. But it didn't last. From the back of the crowd, a venomous voice called out, Kwame, leave. Take your things, your mother, your son, and get out of this town. We don't want to see how that child grows. Nobody does. The words cut deep, and Kwame lowered his head, the anger and sorrow inside him mixing into something almost unbearable. No one understood. No one cared about his pain, his sacrifice. Then softly Amina took his hand and whispered, Tell them, son. It's time. They need to hear the truth. Then they will forgive. With a heavy heart, Kwame climbed back onto the makeshift stage. His voice, though quiet at first, grew steadier as he spoke. Let me tell you all the story of what really happened. With his hand on his heart, he spoke softly, asking for a moment of attention. The room fell into silence. Even the father, out of respect, gave the young man a nod, allowing him to speak. Kwame looked at his mother, who with pride in her eyes, smiled at him, encouraging him to begin. Nine months ago, I had an amazing woman by my side. Her name was Zuri, and her heart was the purest anyone could ever know. I decided to marry her because I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. After our wedding we began talking about having a child. The crowd listened, mesmerized. Many remembered seeing him with a beautiful woman, holding hands as they walked through town, always laughing, always close, either strolling arm in arm or driving together in his car. Whispers spread through the room as people started to wonder what had happened to her. A doctor, who had been following the story closely, couldn't help but ask, so where is she now? Kwame's smile wavered, his face reflecting the depth of his pain, the kind that comes only from losing the one you love most. Heads lowered in anticipation of the tragedy about to unfold. One afternoon while I was working Kwame gestured toward the building builder, I got a call telling me that my wife had been in a terrible car accident. She was in critical condition, having lost too much blood. The only way to save her was through an immediate transfusion. Many recalled that day when the young man rushed to the hospital. I donated my blood, he continued, but it was already too late. She was in her final moments. All I could do was hold her, talk to her, and make the most of the little time we had left as husband and wife. Tears began to roll down his cheeks, his voice trembling with sorrow. The audience sat in stunned silence, some openly weeping, 
moved by the deep sadness that radiated from Kwame. A day before she passed, he whispered, Zuri opened her eyes and told me she had a few last wishes. He paused, the memory overwhelming him. Kwame, look at me, Zuri had said, her smile faint but full of love. I don't want to lose you. You are the love of my life, and I will always be by your side. But I need you to fulfill one last wish for me, even if I won't be here to see it. Kwame's hands covered his face as he sobbed, and the entire town felt his pain as if it were their own. She wanted me to have a child he finally managed to say, and she trusted only one person to help make that happen my mother. She asked that her eggs be harvested, and they were implanted in my mother so I could become a father. The crowd gasped, overwhelmed by the unexpected twist. Guilt washed over them as they realized how they had judged him so harshly, completely unaware of the unimaginable grief he had been living through. Amina, standing with the baby in her arms, spoke up as well. Zuri was an extraordinary woman. She loved my son deeply and stood by him through everything. When I heard about her accident, I immediately called him to be by her side. Those final moments were unbearable. Amina's voice cracked as tears filled her eyes, and the crowd shared in her pain, understanding her not just as a mother-in-law, but as a mother. She had feared for Kwame every time he left the house, uncertain if he would ever return. The weight of a mother's anxiety was clear. And all the women in the room, especially those who were mothers themselves, felt her agony deeply. I lost jobs Kwame's voice rose with frustration. I was beaten, humiliated. People laughed at me, shouted things. They wouldn't even leave me in peace at school. He slammed his fist down, anger and grief boiling over. I didn't deserve that. Neither of us did. And now you all need to understand that it's wrong to treat people like this. The townspeople lowered their heads, ashamed of how they had treated him, realizing that their cruelty had only added to his already unbearable burden. One by one, people began to speak, starting with the older man who had treated him so poorly. Son, he said softly, I was wrong. I let rumors and gossip guide my actions and I did things I regret. He lowered his head, then continued. Kwame was always there to help me when I needed it. He'd run up the mountain at dawn to gather wood for me, always with a smile on his face. I'm ashamed of how I acted. The apologies came one after another. People shared stories of Kwame's kindness, how he had once helped a woman at the hospital when her mother was ill, working tirelessly to make sure she had food and care. He had never asked for anything in return not even when she couldn't afford to pay him. Someone else remembered how Kwame had helped replace a broken TV for a neighbor, rallying others to pitch in. And when a local restaurant was robbed, Kwame, upon learning that the culprits were starving children, took responsibility for covering the damages. A police officer stood up, visibly moved. This young man is one of the bravest I've ever known, he said. On behalf of the entire police department, I owe you a heartfelt apology. We misjudged you. He paused, looking Kwame in the eye. Never stop seeing the good in people, because people like you, with a heart as big as yours, are rare. A little girl, shyly tugging at her mother's dress, whispered, Kwame found my doll when it fell into the sewer. He cleaned it and played with me and mommy in the yard. The mother smiled sadly, adding, he's a good boy. We should all be asking for his forgiveness, shouldn't we, sweetheart? The room was quiet, the weight of collective guilt heavy in the air. Slowly the apologies came, heartfelt and sincere, as they trickled out of the room one by one. The father followed, slipping away quietly. Though he said nothing, everyone knew that deep down. He too wished he could offer his deepest apologies. After all, he had never forgotten how Kwame, devoted to his faith, had come to paint the church, volunteering his time without ever being asked. This is how it happened. The father, who had been the most resistant to what was unfolding, eventually left and returned home, leaving Amina and Kwame alone with the newborn baby, Kamau, who had only been in the world for a few hours. They insisted it was God's will and that no one had the right to judge them. Kamau remained under the care of the nurses for another two days, during which time they confirmed he was a beautiful, healthy infant without any issues. While still at the hospital, Kwame had time to reflect on many things. As he returned home, 
he began to realize the weight of these revelations. Sometimes the harshest storms in life bring unexpected blessings. They pass, leaving behind tragedy, but also revealing something beautiful, if we take the time to appreciate it. Kwame had endured countless emotional blows he never anticipated, and these trials changed the way he saw the world forever. Amina, too, came to understand just how difficult motherhood could be. She had known this all along since Kama was her second child, but once again she was reminded of the importance of treating people with compassion, making room for them in our hearts. From the start, Amina knew that Zuri's request would be complicated and bring darkness, but now in front of her was the undeniable blessing that had come from it. Kwamina and little Kamal celebrated his first birthday together. Many neighbors and townspeople brought gifts, a sign that they hadn't forgotten everything that had happened and likely never would. The event had left a lasting mark on everyone involved. Kamal was now attending preschool and playing with the other children. Parents spoke to their older kids, cautioning them not to make any remarks about the past, as they too had been there that day. Some of the townspeople felt guilty for allowing their children to mock Kwamim and Amina's situation. Despite everything, Amina found growing joy in holding her little boy, loving and nurturing him as she had done with her first child, showering him with patience and warmth. There is, after all, no greater love than that of a devoted mother. Meanwhile, Kwame completed his university studies and had become a skilled engineer. He now helped his friend, a construction worker, with projects, and the two had grown close as business partners and friends. Kwame had even asked his friend to be Kamal's godfather, a request that was happily accepted. At home, Amina sat in the living room with her children. Kwame, though, seemed uneasy as he played with Kamal. Amina, noticing his mood, asked him, Honey, what's wrong? You've been so quiet since yesterday and I don't like seeing you like this. Kwame placed Kamal on the floor, letting him run around, and then sat down with his mother, whispering, I don't want Kamal to ever know the truth that you're both his mother and mine. Amina gently responded, I've thought about it, and it's better he hears it from us rather than from others, Kwame. She paused and continued, When he's a bit older, we'll take him to a counselor who can help him understand. But I can't be the one to tell him. We've already suffered so much. He might end up hating us, Mama. Kwame's heart broke as his mother spoke. It was an unusual fear, one that had surfaced the very first time Kamal called him daddy knowing that one day Kamal would realize he had no mother to call his own. However, they agreed that when the time was right, with the help of a professional, they would tell Kamal the whole truth, free from the town's gossip. After all, some still harbored resentment toward the family over the events surrounding Kamal's birth. Kwame took every chance he could to take Kamal to church, wanting to introduce his son to the house of God. It was important to him to share with Kamal the beauty of worship and singing praises. One Sunday they encountered the priest, and Kwame decided to speak with him. Pastor Dlamini, he said, I want you to know that my little boy will be joining me at Sunday Mass, and whenever you need help, we'll be there to paint God's house. You can count on us. The pastor hesitated for a moment, glancing at the other clergy, who seemed to be watching closely, noticing the tension. Kwame continued, Look into my Kamau's eyes. He had nothing to do with what happened. He's innocent, and he shouldn't bear the burden of Zuri's accident. My faith in my sons is stronger than all of that. The pastor softened, nodding, and embraced both of them. This is God's house, he said, and if it's his will for you and Kamau to be here, you're always welcome. Kwame had never felt such relief. He had made peace with nearly everyone in town, and most importantly, they had begun to see Kama with kindness. His son wouldn't have to endure the rejection or pain he feared. Kama would grow up to be a fine young man and eventually a compassionate adult, just like his father. Now, every morning when Kama wakes up and sees a picture of a beautiful woman on his father's nightstand, he asks, who is she? Kwame gently tells him, that's your mom. On certain days, Kamal asks where she is, and Kwame still struggles to find the right words. But Amina reminds him that everything happens in its own time. For now, they just tell Kamal that his mother is far away, watching over him, singing him to sleep, and reminding him that he is loved beyond measure. 
Every Sunday after church, the family visits Zuri's final resting place, bringing red and yellow flowers her favorites. Afterward, they return home to play with Kamal, helping him with his schoolwork and spending time with neighbors who have become kinder with each passing day. Amina and Kwamiam understood that though their family wasn't what they had envisioned a year ago, they were incredibly happy, and the most important thing of all was that they were together. Friends, that's where our story ends today. What are your thoughts on Zuri's final request? Do you think it was right for Amina to be both mother and grandmother to Kamal? This story is a powerful reminder of the need for compassion, understanding, and forgiveness. Kwame and Amina's journey teaches us that harsh judgment only deepens pain, while love and faith can heal even the deepest wounds. Before condemning others, we must seek to understand their struggles and show mercy, as our faith teaches. O oh Allah, guide us to be compassionate and forgiving, and protect those facing trials. Grant us hearts that uplift and hands that help, reminding us that only you know the full story of each soul's journey. Amin. Let us know your thoughts in the comments so we can all share our opinions. And don't forget to give us a like and share this story with your friends and family. Are so grateful for your presence. God bless you all.